My name is Ruben Zilberspick. I'm the Development Officer here at the Jewish Holocaust Centre. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the man behind the photos you'll be seeing today, Mr Horst Eisfelder. Mm. Um, I first met Horst, uh, uh, in a, I think it was 1996, uh, when Horst was, I interviewed him for the Shoah Foundation. Apart from hearing Horst's amazing story, I was privileged to be shown his photo collection of his time in Shanghai and Nanjing. Mm -hmm. You were in Nanjing as well? I'm afraid the way the sound comes over is all distorted. I'll come closer to yeah. you. Um, you were in Nanjing as well, weren't you, Horst? Yes. Thank you. Um, since then, since seeing Horst and seeing his photos back 20, 20 years ago almost, um, I've always had the desire to see Shanghai and I haven't fulfilled that wish yet and I couldn't work out why. And on reflection, I can honestly say that this interest was fuelled by Horst's evocative photos, which you will see today. And it is the evocative nature of these photos that prompted this function today. While the Jewish Refugees in Shanghai exhibition goes some way to describe um, certain events around this unique Holocaust story, we felt that hearing from someone who was there and who chronicled daily life was an important adjunct to the exhibition's written word. The combination of images and the story behind the images, uh, as told by an eyewitness such as Horse, has far greater impact than just mere text. So um, the aim today is to he hear from Horst about his life in Shanghai, utilising his photographs as a springboard to illuminate us about that period in history. So we'll, we'll just mainly be listening to Horst today and his reflection of his photos. Um, now, I asked Horst when I first approached him with this project to pick his top 20 photos. And now that's a big ask for someone who took photos over a number of years, but time does not permit us to go through his entire collection. Uh, if you want to see more of Horst's photos, there is a computer screen we've set up at the back of the exhibition, which has a large number of his photos, and you can just go, th go through that at your leisure. Um, if we have time today, we'll also ha we've added some extra photos that Horst gave me outside his top 20, which he will uh, illuminate us about, but we'll see how we go for time. Um, now, a bit about Horst, very brief bit. Horst Eisfelder was born in Berlin, Berlin in 1925. In October 1938, along with his parents and brother, he made his way to Shanghai, where the family remained for almost nine years. In July 1947, they came to Australia. So that's the end of the script. Now we're going to start with the photos. But before we start with the photos, I'd like to ask Horst, mm -hmm. what prompted you to start taking photos when you were there? In my childish innocence, I thought we'd be back in Berlin within a short time, two or three years, and I could show all these interesting photos to family and friends. Of course, reality was quite different. But once having started taking photos, I kept on taking photos because they support your memory. Can you tell me the equipment that you used? What sort of camera did you have? For the first few years in Shanghai, I used my brother's box camera that he had received for his bar mitzvah in uh, early uh, uh, 37. Um, so uh, for the first few years, I had only the most basic equipment. Uh, later on, I acquired a somewhat better camera, but nothing fancy. It had no exposure meter. It had no way of uh, automatic focusing. It was all a matter of guesswork. Mm. And did you have any training at all? Any no training at all. But uh, in early 42, through my employment then, I met with a certain Stefan König, and a very few of the photos in my collection were taken by him, who taught me a fair bit about photography. Later on, in mid-44, I obtained a kind of apprenticeship with a refugee photographer. 
but my work there was almost entirely limited to darkroom work, developing films, making prints and enlargements. And just one other question before we start seeing the yeah. photos. How old were you when you started taking photos? I had turned 13 on the way to Shanghai. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think we'll start with the first photo now. Can you describe what we're seeing here, please? That photo was taken a day or two after arriving, looking north from our then accommodation. It showed in the foreground that most of that area had been destroyed uh, during the fighting between the Japanese invasor, invaders and the Chinese forces. Now, in the background, you see some very substantial modern buildings. And we thought that this would make nice accommodation. But they were only part of the vast municipal jail, which provided the best accommodation in that part of town. And what, about, what, are, the ruins, what are the ruins in the front? They used to be dwellings, but interesting enough, they were restored within a year or two of our arrival and became very much the center of the Jewish refugee community in Shanghai. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go on to the next photo. Now, this was one of the main streets in what became known as the ghetto. The term ghetto is actually uh, out of place. It was used for simplicity. The official name was the designated area for stateless refugees, and even the definition of stateless refugees was limited to those who had arrived in Shanghai after uh, 1937. Uh, the so-called ghetto was not surrounded by any walls, fences, or gates. The Jewish refugee population within that area was only a tiny fraction of the total population in the so-called ghetto. And can you tell me what the buildings are? Do you, know, do you remember yeah. what any of the buildings were? The big were? building uh, on the left here housed a movie theater known as the Broadway Theater. On its roof uh, became the location of a large Jewish uh, refugee coffee house known as the Roy Roof Garden Restaurant. There may be later on a photo taken of that establishment. Did, were there any, what was shown at the theater? What sort of movies? Was it Western, Chinese? Yes. The movie houses in Shanghai showed mostly American and British films until December uh, 41. In fact, they still kept showing them for a few weeks till the Japanese banned the screening of uh, American or English films. Did you go to movies at the theatre? We went a lot to the movies, especially in summer, because while Shanghai never got as hot as Melbourne, nowhere as hot, but it had a very high humidity. And the, air, the uh, movie theatres were all air-conditioned. So that was one reason to go there. Uh, one of our acquaintances became the manager of a brand new uh, movie house, and he gave us a free pass if we could go as often as we liked. We'll move on to the, to the next slide. Now, this does not look like Shanghai now, 1940. As you can see, this photo was taken in colour. In other words, it was taken with a digital camera on a return visit to Shanghai. The reason I took it is because way back in the early days, I never got around to take a photo. This was a very modern office building owned by Sir Victor Sassoon, one of the wealthiest men in Shanghai. And he placed it at the disposal of the large numbers of Jewish refugees arriving in early 1939. Uh, the office building was mostly vacant because it was located in the Japanese defense sector of the international settlement. And in those days, people tried to stay away from the Japanese sector of the international settlement. So he made the most of it by putting it at the disposal of the Jewish refugees. But it was only used for a very short time. Uh, I don't know the reasons, but I've got my own thoughts why uh, it was not used uh, for any length of time. What are those thoughts? 
They wanted the newly arrived refugees as far away from the business center as possible. This building, known as the Embankment Building, is located next door to the General Post Office. And right opposite, it's on, in front of the uh, Sutra Creek, that is, you can see at the bottom left, the Sutra Creek that runs to the northern part of Shanghai is about as wide as the Yarra River in downtown Melbourne. And uh, on the other side is the main business center. They preferred the newly arrived refugees to be kept at a distance, at a far corner of the Japanese defense sector of the Dachau settlement. Uh, by the using of vacant schools, vacant uh, government buildings, vacant warehouses in this war ravaged sector of Shanghai, uh, camps were established for the Jewish refugees to keep them out of sight. Thank you. We'll go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. This was taken in the main street, dividing the international settlement on the north side and the French concession on the south side. It was, it still is the widest street in Shanghai, although nowadays there's an express, ele elevated expressway over this very wide street. I took this photo because it shows one of the many corpses you would see every day in Shanghai. On average, 80 corpses were picked up by the Blue Cross Benevolent Society who took them to an outer part of Shanghai where they were burned. It's a tough question to ask because I'm asking something that occurred, that occurred mm. you know, 60 years ago, 70 yeah. years ago. How was it for you, how confronting was it for you to see this sort of thing? Well, in the as streets? other people put it to me, when I asked a senior official on a return visit to Berlin, which was then still surrounded by the Soviet sector, you get used to everything. And you said there were approximately 80 corpses yes. a day you would, see, you would see in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the cause, do you know what the cause of the... Often it was starvation, it was illness. In winter it was exposure to the cold. Many of these people who fled from all over the country into Shanghai to get away from the Japanese and sought security within the international settlement or the French concession, we were without jobs, without an income. Thank you. We'll go on to the next slide. This yep. is just to show one of these struggling richer coolies against one of the modern high-rise hotels, the Park Hotel, located in the very center of Shanghai, opposite the vast race course, which was a very important institution located in the very center of the uh, international settlement. Before we go on to the next slide, this one fascinated me, and this is, um, I was talking to our curator, Jane Joseph, about, about these photos of horses. If you can imagine, a horse, you're 13, approximately 13 when you took this photo? As I looked up the other day when you were at my home. I've got the date of most of these photos recorded. This was taken in October 1938. Okay, so about 13 years old, born in 1929, so... Uh, uh, 30, 39, yeah, 39. 39. October 39. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, and the thing I'd like to draw your attention to is one of the great um, things about a good photographer is how they frame a photo. And while I'm not an authority, I, my father was a photographer and I grew up looking at photos. So, and the way that horses frame this photo is captured, you know, the coolie in the front with the, thing, uh, the building in the back and the um, perspective is just, for me, I don't know how it impacts on you, is quite amazing. And you'll see more of this in horses. Um, uh, uh, the, the following photos, and the other thing is, unlike digital cameras where we could just, um, today, just take a photo, look at it, and say, that's no good, throw that out. He framed it, he took the photo, and this was the result. And that's, that's what astounds me about these. Not only does he capture a moment, but he, he makes you feel as if you're there almost. And that's what's so amazing about these photos. This is one of the photos not taken by myself, by uh, Stefan, was taken by Stefan König, whom I mentioned earlier. He was commissioned by the aid committee who looking after the refugees to record the refugee community. It is one of the many dormitories where the refugees were accommodated 
at least those who could not afford private accommodation. There would have been up to 50 double-decker beds in the one room and no other furniture. People could keep their few belongings on or under their bed. Of course, there was no security for private possessions, with most of the people unemployed and unable to earn any income. Uh, there was no real security for private property. Did people remain here for the duration of the war? There would have been at least 3,000 or more who spent their entire time in Shanghai in such dormitories. And who took care of their welfare, feeding them, clothing them, etc.? Well, as early as about August or September 38, the uh, local authorities established an international aid committee, more widely known as the Coma Committee, because it was in charge of Mr. Paul Koma, a Hungarian businessman who was not Jewish and who was founded mostly by Sir Victor Sassoon, one of the wealthy Baghdadi Jews in Shanghai, to provide assistance to the new arrivals. Uh, an interesting point is that Mr. Paul Koma also worked closely in collaboration with the German consulate, who kept very close records of who was arriving. Thank you. We're going to the next. This, again, a photo not taken by myself, because as a teenager I couldn't walk into the refugee camps and take photos there. But it shows people queuing up at the soup kitchen for their daily meal in one of these camps. Why couldn't you walk into that place? I think I would be considered an intruder as a teenager <laughs> with my camera amongst the relatively poverty stick multitude. And how was it that you did not end up with other refugees, you and your family, did not up with, end up with refugees in the dormitories and in the... Uh, the yeah. experience of my family was very much different from most of the other Jewish refugees. Firstly, we were amongst the early arrivals. We arrived there in November 38. By then, relatively few people had come to Shanghai. And the well-established Jewish community of Russian origin and the very wealthy Safari community in Shanghai gave us considerable individual support. Another big difference was that unlike most of the new arrivals, we arrived with money because a much older brother of my father's, who had been a successful businessman in New York, had promised to provide us with a thousand American dollars under the condition that we would not come to America. A thousand dollars in those days in Shanghai was a fortune. The Coma Committee, or the International Committee, as it was officially called, told my father, with $1,000, you can live here in comfort for three years. And if the situation in Europe would not have resolved itself after three years, we'll look after you. My father didn't take that well-meant advice. And with the help of one particular Russian Jew, uh, we were able to establish a very successful coffee house business that uh, provided a relatively good income for us. Sure, our accommodation, by Melbourne standards, was very primitive. By Shanghai standards, we lived infinitely better than 99% of the other Jewish refugees. Um, we'll just move on to the next one. Yeah. Now, earlier on, you saw the destroyed dwellings. They were rebuilt, and this is one of the narrow laneways in this restored path, which became very much the center of the ghetto. The official address of this laneway was number 54, Chuzan Road. Chuzan Road became the commercial hub of the so-called ghetto. Again, I draw your attention to the framing, the way that um, horses frame this photo. And uh, now we're going to jump 60 years now, I took the same photo uh, 11 years ago from the same point, uh, same position, 
in full glorious colour. Can you go back, back Adam? This was a street scene in the so-called ghetto, a street market, showing on the right there my then girlfriend, who also came to live later on in Melbourne. This brings me to ask a question, Sam, uh, Horst, I should say. Mm. Culturally, you yeah. came from Berlin uh, yeah. uh, as, a young, as yeah. a young boy, a, a cultured city, uh, yeah. uh, grand buildings, etc. You came to this mass of, mm. of people of poverty, as you described it. Mm. How was that for you to, to just be thrown into that sort of a culture? Actually, on the contrary, before we left, we had absolutely no idea what to expect. There was no internet. There was no Google. Nobody could tell us anything about it, Shanghai. And my father was convinced that we would be living in bamboo huts where the windows would only have rice paper instead of glass. Yet when our ship, the passenger liner, steamed up the Wangpu, or now called Huangpu River, we saw all these modern high-rise buildings, bigger and more magnificent than we'd ever seen in Berlin. There were the double-decker buses that were much more than Berlin. There were electric trolley buses. There were some 50 radio stations in Shanghai. It was a city way ahead of its time, or way ahead of what we had experienced in Europe. Sure, there was extensive poverty, uh, but uh, you could have a wonderful life if you had a good income. Uh, what about the language? The local language, there was actually no such thing as a local language. Most of the people spoke what was known as Shanghainese, but which I think was actually the Ningpu dialect. Most businessmen spoke the Cantonese dialect. A few people, especially in the Kuni class, spoke the Gompu dialect. Very few people spoke Mandarin. People speaking Cantonese could not possibly understand somebody who speaks in Shanghai. They are not dialects. They are completely different languages. The, the words bear no similarity to one another. Uh, Businessmen from different parts of China would communicate with each other by writing rather than speaking to each other because the written language are symbols and they can be understood by everyone. Even nowadays, when you see new scripts from China on TV here, there's always Chinese subtitles because in Chinese television, everything is in Mandarin, which to most Chinese is a foreign language. Sure, they all learn Mandarin at school, but it's a foreign language, and by having the subtitles, they can follow what is being said. Did you pick up any Mandarin or any, any of the dialects? Only the local dialect, just enough to make myself understood. I couldn't carry on conversation. My late brother could converse, and I met others who not only could converse, but could read and write perfectly. My family had to employ a Jewish lawyer to fight a court case on our behalf. He could do so, having mastered not only spoken and written Chinese, but also mastered Chinese law to argue our case. This is interesting. I haven't heard this story. Um, what was the court case about? In our coffee house restaurant, like in any restaurant, there's provision to hang up your overcoat. And like a restaurant, you have to look after your gear. Well, one woman claimed that somebody went out with her fur coat and held us responsible. We felt we had a good court case, so did our Jewish lawyer. But the way Chinese courts worked, it depended on whoever paid the judge the most and got the verdict. Who won the court case? Uh, this woman won the court case. <laughs> So, again, it's, 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 historically, it's such a, for me, such a bizarre thing to hear this. Now, here are these German refugees in Shanghai under Japanese regime going to court about a stolen fur coat. It's, it's just bizarre. This is just a small section of the purpose-built school for the Jewish refugee children. Uh, this was entirely financed 
by the Kanduri family, uh, one of the extremely wealthy Sephardic families in Shanghai. The school was well equipped, uh, had good teachers, and although the children came all from German-speaking homes, the language of instruction was English. Did you go to this school? No. There was another old established Jewish school located about 10 minutes walk from our coffee house and home that I attended. But that was run entirely differently. In my days, most of the teaching staff there, with two notable exceptions, were totally unqualified and unfamiliar with the subjects they were supposed to teach. Uh, after a bit over a year at the school, I realized that I was wasting my time there. While my English was initially limited, but on topics like geometry or geography, where you don't need English to realize that the teachers don't know what they're talking about, I asked my parents for permission to leave the school. As it turned out, a very few weeks later, the Jewish community had come to the same conclusion. Most of the teachers were sacked and qualified people were employed. Now, I'd mentioned earlier the roof garden, Roy Roof Garden Coffeehouse Restaurant. I took this photo. This was the only professional assignment I ever had by working for the photographer. It showed the crowd. This was in the summer of 44 or summer of 45. There were always enough people in the so-called ghetto, enough amongst our Jewish refugees who could afford a reasonably uh, good lifestyle. I saw this photo um, about oh, a couple, few weeks ago when Horst and I went through, went through these. And something struck me. I'm looking at the photo, I'm thinking, what a fantastic shot. You've got the cityscape behind. You've got this rooftop garden with uh, a large mass of people. It could be anywhere in Europe almost. And then you've got this roof. And then I think, hang on, how did he take the photo? How did you take the photo, Horst? I had to climb up on this uh, temporary roofing there. You see, my Jewish refugee employer, the photographer, was asked to have these photos taken. He couldn't imagine climbing up there, so he sent me to take the photos. <laughs> these were the only photos I ever took on his behalf. This was one of the other many Jewish little restaurants, coffee houses, established uh, in the so-called ghetto. The young man standing in the doorway also came to live here in, in Melbourne, in Caulfield. He died a few years ago. What was his name? Uh, Glogauer. Now, Horst, you, when you showed me this photo at your house mm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, you translated the, what's, on, what's on the window? What's written on the window? Well, they offer, in the inscription there, amongst other things, icy, in German, ice-cold water, which was a special delicacy in a hot summer. And you couldn't drink the tap water for risk of in infections. All water had to be either boiled or uh, filtered or somehow chemically treated before you could drink it. And having a shop selling ice-cold water in summer was quite attractive. Where did, do you know where they got the ice-cold water from? As in no. filtered? <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, Originally, in our originally uh, coffee house that we had established, we had a proper electric refrigerator, very ex expensive. And by the time we paid it off, uh, we had to get we were kicked out by the Japanese and lost it. In the ghetto, we only had an ice chest. Mm. And whilst we're on the subject of, of water and cafes, mm. I don't think I've asked you this question before, it, uh, but. Yeah. What about food, as in local food? Did you indulge in... As long as you had money, everything was available. My family always ate well. Every day I had plenty of cakes, any amount of chocolate I wanted. Uh, compared to the rest of the community, our food was very, very good. Uh, cooking our meals was another story, because from roughly from mid-33 or 30, a bit later, gas and electricity were severely rationed. You couldn't use electricity or gas for cooking. 
And most people used little Japanese uh, cooking stoves that were fired by locally made um, briquettes. But these briquettes consisted of a mixture of coal dust, straw, sand, and water, with more straw and water than coal dust. Uh, it was very difficult to keep the flame alive. This was a task that my aunt, who lived with us, uh, had to cook our meals on this very primitive fixture. But everybody was in the same situation during those years. Did you and your family um, uh, eat the local food as opposed Chinese cuisine as opposed to yes. what you were used to in, in yeah. Germany? The interesting thing is, even in pre-war days, there were Chinese restaurants in Berlin, but nobody considered ever trying that sort of exotic food. But in Shanghai, we very quickly got used to Chinese food, and it was quite a treat to visit some of these. There was one very famous restaurant in well-known Dunking Road, or now known as Dunjing uh, uh, Donglu, um, that was especially good and uh, enjoyable. On my return visit, on behalf of German television, who produced the 45-minute television documentary on my Shanghai story, the Chinese uh, interpreter employed by German television wanted to take us to that restaurant of an evening. And we all went there in great expectations, only to be told that they're fully booked out and there was no hope of us getting in there. <laughs> now, this was the commercial hub of the so-called ghetto, Chusan Road. You might see some German inscription on the buildings there on the top. That's where you met your friends. That's where business was transacted. That's where you met everybody. Now, this is another feature. You have to explain that in Shanghai of the good olden days, just like in Melbourne in the 1950s and 60s, many parts of town were without sewerage. In Melbourne, the buckets were collected once a week and exchanged for an empty one. In Shanghai, the buckets were collected every day early morning, somewhere between midnight and six in the morning, and poured into the sand cart often leaking, and uh, it was quite an uh, experience. For instance, where we had our coffee house originally, right opposite was the remains of a Chinese village without sewerage, and every morning around three o'clock, the school year would call out his usual signal, and people came out with their buckets, emptied them into his cart, and then scrubbed them with bamboo brushes very vigorously for at least 10 minutes and then take them back into their house for further use. And what did the Jewish community call these carts? Well, again, many of the homes where our people had to live were without sewerage. But my father was very enterprising. When we had to relocate to the so-called ghetto, he saw to it that we had a flush toilet. The street had no sewerage. He saw to it that it was connected to the street's drainage system. But what you told me when we met, what, what you called, what it was, these carts were called by the local Jewish community. What name did you oh, use? They were called, the buckets were called honey pots, and this was called the honey cart. <laughs> the Chinese term for the buckets was ma dong, which actually means horse bucket. Love the humour. Yeah. Um, again, once again, I, the, the framing of that photo where he captures the movement of the, without knowing, captures the movement of the, the, um, the gentleman pu pushing the cart, the cart's the centre of focus, the people in the background. Again, beautifully, beautifully taken photo. Under the Japanese, we were all enrolled in a, what was, they called power child. It's too complicated to explain, but we were forced to participate in firefighting drills in case of bombing raids causing widespread fires. We had no choice in this. We had to participate whether we liked it or not. This particular exercise took place in front of the police hospital. 
and some of the patients are looking up from a balcony there. Now, the interesting thing is on the far right corner, you see an ambulance discharging its cargo because that day there had been a gunfight between soldiers and police in another part of town. And the, the ambulance is discharging wounded police from that gunfight to the police hospital. The young man on the left here was uh, Peter, um, um, I can't remember his name now. Within a few years in Melbourne, he became director of the Maya Emporium, but he had to resign because of ill health, and he died a good many years ago here in Melbourne. Mm. Horst, I just thought of something. Yeah. Did you basically just wander the streets at leisure with your camera on a yeah. daily basis? For most of my life, I've always carried a camera with me and taken what seemed to be an interesting scene. But strangely enough, in recent years, this is my digital camera, I've taken very few photos. There is a lack of inspiration. There are no new impressions. The grandchildren don't change much from one year to another. Uh, there's not much point in taking photos now. <laughs> but, but back then, yeah. that was your... I virtually you, you, always carried a camera with me. So, mm. but you, you said you asked your parents if you could leave school, which yes. they, they agreed. Mm. So, were your daytimes... Did you work in the, your parents' cafe? Did you... there, there was no real use for me in my parents' coffee house. But my mother asked every customer, have you got a job for my son? Um, one of the customers, the Jewish refugee, said, look, I have got some contacts. And he asked me to come and visit him in his home, very nice home that he had. And he introduced me to a Swiss import-export firm that employed me as an office assistant. And I did a great variety of interesting work working for the Swiss import-export firm. When war broke out on 8th of December, it very much limited export-import business. And some of these Swiss uh, more senior uh, management staff pulled their resources and established a chemical factory where I was employed as the only person in the office. And the factory at times employed about 170 people of whom about 30 were Jewish refugees. Uh, it would take a while to go into other details about this factory, but uh, we might come to that terms later on. And was that your only day job, so to speak, when you were in, the, in Shanghai, uh, during, yes, when, during the war? When that chemical factory folded, because it was never financially successful, I got this job as a kind of apprentice to a refugee photographer. This was in the summer of 44 to 45, when some of the Jewish refugees trying to sell their last belongings amongst the ruins of the so-called ghetto. Who were they selling them to? Yeah. Many, many of the refugees never had the opportunity to earn any money in Shanghai, and they gradually sold off everything that they had. Some sold off their last shirt, if only that they could buy a cigarette or a razor blade. I assume that you said earlier that your parents and your family were relatively well off, yes. so that yes. never occurred to you, that side of the... No. I mean, to give an indication how well off we were, it must have been in the, sometime in '44 that our home got burgled and nearly all our clothing got stolen. Within a few days, we were able to buy entirely new outfits for everybody. Mm. Now, something interesting, too, that I might like to mention, our first original coffee house was located at number 1255, what was then known as Bubbling Well Road. Now it's known as Nanking Road uh, West, or Nanjing Shilu in Chinese. When you go into Google nowadays and look for top-class accommodation in Shanghai, one of the best five-star hotels, one of the most expensive hotels, is located at exactly the same address, 1255 Nanjing Shilu. It's a JC Mandarin Hotel. I purposely went onto Google a few days ago to check up this, and it's one of the most expensive hotels in Shanghai. So we were in a very good location. <laughs> of course. This was on the 18th of August, 1945, 
when the first American officers arrived in Shanghai, and behind them are some of the uh, Jewish dignitaries. Uh, on the right are the two Kaduri brothers who had been interned by the Japanese, and uh, they are now returning to their leading position in Shanghai. The Kaduris, while the Chinese kicked them out of all their possessions in Shanghai, still control much of Hong Kong's utilities. And even in Shanghai, they donated money for a gallery in Shanghai's main museum. Was this photo taken under any sort of official... Hmm. Were you there on, a, on an official position or just, I was again, there just as a bystander. Just taking yeah, photos. Yeah. This was also after the war and shows Bitar, a unit of Bitar on the march in Shanghai. Was, did Beitar um, exist and was, was, it, was it active during the actual war itself? I don't think it was very active during the Japanese uh, ghetto, so-called ghetto period. But as soon as uh, the war was over, all these groups could fully officially function again. Some people have claimed we didn't know what happened in Europe, what happened in the war. The Russians, being considered neutral, had their radio station in Shanghai where they broadcast the news every day. And I bought a, map, a very detailed map of Russia, of uh, European Russia, that the Russian had on sale in Shanghai, where every night, listening to the news from February 43 onwards, I marked the Russian advance towards Germany. I still got that map. Every day I penciled in the new front line. Every month I drew the new, new front line in ink, and I say I still got that map. So we certainly knew what went on in Europe. We were not cut off. In fact, in early February 43, on the radio, we heard Goebbels speak in Berlin, saying, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, Stalingrad will be ours. A few days later, the Germans surrendered at Stalingrad. Many people have claimed that Shanghai was always terribly hot. This shows my late brother outside our other restaurant, a coffee house in the so-called ghetto in winter. Now, this, these are the, the tourist's top 20 photos that, he, that he, I asked him to choose. Fortunately, when I was there about a couple of weeks ago, he had a much larger selection of other photos and I just couldn't resist including them in this as well. So we'll just continue now with the next photos. This was our original coffee house, I say at the same location as the JC Mandarin Hotel nowadays. And what about the little busboy or whatever in yeah. the front? Who was he? That was considered essential, but after a few weeks we found we could dispense with him. What was his job? To just open the door to Gaston. <laughs> yeah. Stupid question, really. That was the inside. These were not taken by me. My box camera in those days was not able to take such photos. This is the inside. My father's on the lower photo. Do we see? Which, which one is your father on behind the, the counter? the lower photo is my father, yeah. Behind the, the counter? That was our bakery crew showing in the middle my brother and one of his school friends who also worked in our bakery. All the rest were Chinese. And you never worked in the bakery? I never worked there. I would have been surplus to requirements. <laughs> this is one of the main streets. As far as I remember, this was taken shortly after the war in Shanghai. When, <laughs> with the outbreak of war in December, 41, petrol for private use was no longer available at any price. So quite a few people uh, modified their car and put a horse in front. <laughs> this again showed the location of our coffee house. This photo was taken on the last day before we had to surrender it to the Japanese. In the far right hand, you see a bit of my father and the rear of my late brother. So, just to go over this, this was your parents' shop yes. before the surrender to the yeah. Japanese? Yes, before we had a hand over to the Japanese. And then you had another shop after that? Yes. Where, yes. And where was that? Was that within the... That was in the so-called ghetto. 
at the far end of a dead end land. And even though, because you said earlier, yeah. in the ghetto it yeah. was, it was uh, less um, affluent and, yeah. and more deprived. Mm. So they were not only a good many of our own people who managed a reasonable standard of living, but we also got a lot of other people as customers, especially amongst the so-called German, that is not Jewish community. And we had no problem delivering cakes that they ordered from us to their homes in other parts of Shanghai. Most of these deliveries were done by one of my friends in, in Shanghai. He lived in one of the large uh, dormitory uh, camps with his parents. But his mother was a so-called Aryan, and he was a Catholic. So he was not subject to the restrictions. He had a valid German passport. He was free to travel all over Shanghai, and he did all the deliveries for our cakes all over Shanghai. So when you moved to the, to the yeah. ghetto, so yes. to speak, uh, it, was there a great difference between your, your, the way you were living, you and your parents were living? Yes. Well, our accommodation in the ghetto was infinitely better than most of the refugees. It was, by Melbourne standards, extremely crowded and primitive. Uh, Shanghai is full of thousands of laneways, all with identically designed homes. These homes have always one large downstairs room, a little room at the rear, which is often used as a kitchen, and then upstairs, there's a little room over the, what might be the kitchen, and another large room upstairs. In the so-called ghetto, we shared this building with two other married couples and a bachelor. In other words, there were nine of us living there. The large downstairs room had previously been used by Japanese who put in Partition, the typical Japanese lettuce work with rice paper. So the large room was divided into two small rooms. One of the small rooms was occupied by my brother and myself, the other by my parents. Upstairs, one of these small rooms was occupied by my aunt and her husband. The other little room was occupied by a couple. And the little room over the so-called kitchen was occupied by a bachelor. The tiny kitchen, measuring about three by two meters at the most, uh, was also the communal bathroom and toilet, the, the illegal toilet that we used. Uh, there was a Japanese tub there, which had a little uh, chip-fired stove that would circulate the water and keep on heating the bathtub. Uh, we found it not very practical to use. Occasionally, you could buy hot water. There were many hot water shops. Shops that sold nothing but hot water. And the coolie would deliver a few liters hot water, put it into the tub, and you'd take a bath. But that was a very rare occasion. On the other hand, while working at the chemical factory, located at the far end of uh, Shanghai, at the other end of Shanghai, we had several hot showers and could take as many hot showers as we liked. This was the outside of that coffee house in the ghetto at the far end of a dead end lane. Again, my parents in the foreground. At the far right is my cousin who on and off worked there. And also in the background is the other man who was originally a partner to establish that second coffee house. But uh, it was not a happy partnership. and My parents were able to buy him out after a few months. That was inside. At the top, you see a sign, whipped cream. In other words, everything was available as long as you had the money to pay for it. Uh, that was a business card uh, used by my father. The coat of arms on the left was my father's own design. He was very good at drawing and sketching and things like that. Is that a, a pie tin yeah. and, and a, yeah. like a pretzel? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. This was my parents on their 25th wedding anniversary. As a teenager, I thought people being married for 25 years is an eternity. <laughs> now, 
our own two boys have been married a lot longer than 25 years. It goes to show how the perspective of time changes. This was an identity card everybody had to carry. I still carry a photocopy of it with me at all times as a talking point. Uh, this was uh, issued in, uh, uh, according to the Chinese calendar, in the uh, 33rd year of the Chinese Republic, which is 1944, on the uh, 22nd of March. And the yellow stripe on top indicates that the holder is Jewish. Did you have to present this card? Were you asked to present this card? There were some occasions, but in general, you just had to have it with you. So uh, when you were, uh, did you leave the ghetto, so to speak, ghetto yeah. area often? I always had a pass to leave the ghetto. I was never without one. Is this the pass or is this a separate? That was a separate document, entirely separate document. Unfortunately, before we left for Australia, I was working for the American Military Advisory Group in Nanking, as we knew it, now it's called Nanjing. And my father decided to tidy up and threw out a lot of these documents and other things that I had assembled. And was, was it there some sort of a, what was the process to actually leave the ghetto area? Was it, was it involved? Was it simple? There were some official crossing points that had to be meant by Jewish men aged 20 to 45, they had no choice in this. They had to do their duty about once a week to stand there at the official crossing points and make sure that nobody left without a valid pass. Hmm. And there was, so there was never any restrictions, so to speak? To, well, I to was leave. always, uh, the rest of the family, my parents, my brother, and my aunt and uncle never had a pass all those years. They could never leave the ghetto. Whereas I was always free to leave it. And who was guarding, so to speak, the, the stopping people from actually leaving? It was the just government. the Jewish refugees were compelled to do duty at these crossing points. In fact, on the day of the only air raid that caused many casualties in the so-called ghetto, when the American bombed that particular part of Shanghai, 17th of July, 45. My brother was on border duty at one of these crossing points at the far north uh, west corner of the so-called ghetto. And as the bomb started to fall, he dashed home where we kept little suitcases ready to flee the locality. And he was very fortunate because much damage was done at the very point where he was supposed to be stationed to control the crossing. It was next to one of the refugee camps that was hit by bombs, causing a good many fatalities. This was taken after the war, when the police intercepted what they saw as suspicious cargo of Matzot. On the extreme left here, you see the inscription in Hebrew Matzot, and they thought this is a very strange and suspicious cargo. They probably tried, as usual, to elicit a little bribe to letting the cargo go past. This was taken in mid-September uh, 45, when the American fleet arrived in Shanghai. Um, yeah. I, I just draw your attention to, it's almost like a painting, this. The, the, mm. Just the way it's, it's framed, the, the, the blurry buildings out the back, it's quite an astounding photo. It was only fairly recently at an earlier exhibition on the same topic, that I realized that the sign above the group of Yeshiva Bochim advertises a private uh, primary school. Hmm. So, sorry, so... This, sign what, what year was this? That was been taken after the war, about uh, 46 or 45. Um, that's completed the picture part. I'm just wondering if anybody has got any questions for... Yes, there are hands coming up. My God. Considering you know, things during the wartime, did you have a problem getting film for your camera? Until war broke out, films were widely available. The moment the war started, I had great difficulty. And I went from one retailer to another. 
and could occasionally buy a film here and a film there. All this developed in me a habit of usually taking only ever one shot of one subject. Even now with electronic cameras, where there's no cost involved in taking many photos, I still got the habit of usually taking only one photo of any particular object. Um, then, during the war, as old stocks of Kodak film and Aqua film had been exhausted, you could get virtually unlimited quantities of Japanese Fuji film. When working for the uh, refugee photographer, the reason I got a pass to leave the ghetto was that I had to go to town frequently to buy films and plates and photographic papers and chemicals that were only available in other parts of Shanghai. Immediately after the war, Fuji films were no longer available, and American films had not yet arrived. Working for the American Signal Corps then, I had access to American films that were meant for aerial photography. They came in big rolls, and I found a way of cutting them up to my size and put them in my camera, but that was not very successful. When I went for the first time for the Americans to Nanking for a while, most of the photos I took there were useless because the film was flawed and they, uh, most of the photos could not be used. But by about mid-46, uh, perhaps a bit later, American films became available and were freely uh, available then. I noticed you have no pictures of any Japanese in any of these pictures. Was there a reason for that? Uh, actually, in my collection, there is a photo, a portrait photo, of the Japanese official who had the most contact with the Jewish community because he was the man issuing passes to leave the ghetto. It is just one of many. I mean, I've got a memory stick here with hundreds of photos. And there's also a photo of this Japanese official, a portrait photo, taken at the studio where I was working. Because the so-called ghetto was located in the most rundown part of Shanghai, many impoverished white Russians lived there as well. But they were free to come and go as they pleased. Yes, in the so-called ghetto, as Sam pointed out, the white Russians were no friend of Jews, and they, those who were living in that part of Shanghai were mostly uh, very much impoverished and uh, hostile to us. Hmm. Was photography uh, considered as an, a profession for you once you yes. came to Australia? Yes. When I came to Australia, I immediately went to the Commonwealth Employment Service asking for a job. And indeed, they told me, there's a photographer in Ballarat who wants someone. But I was brand new to Melbourne, Victoria. Anyway, I took a train to Ballarat and saw this photographer. And he wanted someone to take wedding photos in nearby townships every weekend or so. And I would have to carry uh, floodlights and cameras, etc to localities that were completely unfamiliar to me. I had no car. Few people had a car in post-war days because petrol was still rationed. And I could, had to decline the offer. I went back to the Commonwealth Employment Service a few days later, and they said, yes, there's a studio in Carlton wanting a plate grader. Now, I had no idea what is a plate grader. Anyway, they sent me to Red Nose Studios located just south of Melbourne University. The owner, an elderly, a very nice elderly gentleman, told me right away, that's not a job for you. It's dirty, it's noisy, you wouldn't like it. But he said, I could employ you as what is known as a lithographic dot etcher. That is a specialized work of doing color correction for color printing. I had no experience of this trade. And in theory, the union required anyone doing this sort of work 
to do a six-year apprenticeship. He employed me anyway, and I quickly learned the tricks of that trade. The union kicked up a bit of a fuss, but my employer said to them, look, I'm happy to sack Mr. Eisfelder as long as you get me a qualified replacement. There was nobody else available in Melbourne with the necessary qualifications. So I kept on working there for a good many years, till I took evening classes at the newly established Melbourne School of Printing and Graphic Arts, where I realized that the methods used by Redner Studios, as it was called, was way out of date. And I got a job offer of a, by another firm using the most advanced process of coloring production. So I changed jobs after seven years. Amongst the many jobs I handled there, there are many reproductions for the National Gallery. One of the most important jobs I ever did was the portrait of the Queen painted by Dagi, the Queen wearing a yellow dress that I had to reproduce in its two colors. Uh, but work at this particular firm was very unhappy. And eventually I changed to another firm in Mentone, which was even un more unhappy. Then I changed to a firm in Carlton, where I was not entirely happy either. And then I realized that I was showing signs of being affected by two carcinogenic chemicals that we were using. And two doctors advised me to leave the job as soon as possible. I had a job standing open offer to work for a small uh, weaving and dye works in Richmond, which I accepted, which was like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. And as soon as possible, I left that job and became an insurance agent for the AMP Society, which made an entirely changed lifestyle. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's proceedings. I, I, I trust you enjoyed yeah. both hearing from Horst mm. and seeing his amazing photos. Can you please yeah. Yeah. thank okay. Horst? Yeah. Uh, before I forget, if you want to know more about my story, and my photos, there are a few copies of my book, Chinese Exile, still available. There are over 80 photos and some documents and a map in each book.